all the cool things people could do with 8-bit processors. We had personal computers, we ran operating systems, we did spreadsheets, word processing, and ran disk drives. We even had some very cool video games. I kind of miss those big pixelated guys. In fact, well, but <laughs> these days to hear people talk, you'd think you needed a 32-bit multi-core memory managed supercomputer just to blink an LED or get Hello World to run at a decent speed. There's just something plain old wrong with that, don't you think? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk, and I'm taking a stand on this out-of-control bit nonsense. There are some really cool things we can and should be doing with 8-bit machines, and I'm going to prove it. My guest today is Wayne Freeman from Microchip Technology, and we're going to talk about functional enablement with 8-bit MCUs. Yes! Before we get started, remember to click that link. There you can download a free data sheet with more information about Microchip's 8-bit PIC microcontroller peripheral integration. Welcome, Wayne. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Amelia. It's great to be here. Fantastic. Okay, so lately in my engineering life, it seems that I'm always having to do more with less. You know, less power, smaller footprint, lower cost, but marketing always seems to want me to have touch screens and IoT in every design. Of course. <laughs> What's the deal with that? You are not alone, Amelia. As you're aware, our industry is in a state of constant flux. Yeah. You've got a combination of economic issues that are causing us to basically get more productivity with fewer people and fewer resources. True. And you've got advances in technology that have enabled radical changes in low-cost embedded designs. Yeah. So now we can add intelligence to just about anything imaginable. And, well, customers kind of want that. Yeah, they do. They've come to expect drastic increases in functionality to everyday electronics, yeah. you know, like IoT and your thermostat. Right. Among these demands, reliability is number one. Sure. Because they want their stuff to last longer than it did, you know, mm -hmm. five, six years ago. Right. And, of course, they want that IoT and their thermostat and the dysfunctionality, and those yeah. kind of rise to the top. So starting with reliability, we'll use lighting as an example. Everyone's okay. kind of switched over. Now we're no longer allowed to purchase incandescent lights. Yeah. Everyone's kind of switched straight from fluorescent lighting over to LED lighting. True. And it's because a bulb will last 25 years. Customers have kind of come to expect that out of us, out of our engineering work. Or it could simply mean that systems are smart enough to basically self-correct as they age yeah. to basically maintain better performance over a longer period of time. And efficiency is, of course, another big one. We are constantly faced with getting that Energy Star certification yeah. or as little as running more off that CR2032 coin cell that we are forced to kind of integrate into our tiniest embedded systems. Right, yeah. And the functionality angle, we've already talked about that. I mean, how many times have you actually given somebody something with an LCD screen and then they start touching it? Right, yeah. <laughs> and, in fact, I did that with my niece the other day. and You know, she picked something like a remote control up and it's got a little indicator screen starts touching it. Why is it not working? Well, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's because, well, it's not a very expensive remote. That's why. <laughs> so that kind of highlights the problem. Sure. That functionality that people are demanding in their everyday appliances and embedded systems basically requires more intelligence from an embedded system. Yeah. And well, this usually means more development time and a higher product cost. Absolutely. That's the challenge that you guys are facing. Yeah. How do you add new functionality and robustness to a system while at the same time not expanding that engineering budget so your boss doesn't get angry and, of right. course, the marketing guys don't come back at you and blame you for the fact the product costs so much more. Right. And, of course, they also want the thing out six months ago instead of ten months from now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've talked to you guys quite a few times before, and I know one of your main businesses as MCUs. How are you guys going to help me with this doing more with less business? Well, I hate to sound like a yoga instructor, uh -oh. but we've kind of taken a holistic approach to system design okay. uh, with our 8-bit PIC MCUs. What we really did over the past few years is took a step back and focused on helping guys like you mm -hmm. solve the problems that you're facing. Okay. Not necessarily adding more performance via higher megahertz CPU, more memory, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But what we did is we essentially shifted the paradigm. So it's really no longer about throwing MIPS at a problem anymore. You take a look at the basic set of tasks or functions that are common to most embedded systems, 
And by doing that, we've been able to kind of increase the product capability by quite a bit mm. without adding all that product cost that you would see out of some microcontroller that has a uh, hundred MIPS of CPU performance. Right. So what we've done over the past few years is we've architected our 8-bit PIC MCU portfolio with both analog and digital peripherals that are highly adaptive and can be used while the CPU's in sleep. Mm, okay. Now, a few years ago, we augmented that with something called a configurable logic cell. Okay. And that basically allows us to glue all these hardware peripherals together, kind of bind them into something that allows you guys to go off and do what we call autonomous function enablement. Uh, okay. Wayne, you threw me there. Um, autonomous function enablement. That's uh, right. What the heck is that? Well, it's not, you know, some sort of a futuristic term or anything. <laughs> it sounds like but one. It, but it is a very marketing-esque <laughs> term, I will admit. <laughs> to explain what we mean by function enablement, mm -hmm. we kind of need to compartmentalize a traditional end product or application. Okay. So if you look at what you do every day, building applications, each one of those is essentially a collection of basic functions oh, or sure. functional tasks. Yeah. Now, depending on the complexity of the application, there can be just one function or there can be many functions. Sure. So when you go to architect those functions, you're going to need to use a combination of on-chip resources or other componentry on the PCB. Sure. Okay. Now, Wayne, I get this at a conceptual level, but give me some specifics on how this maps to the real world. All right. We'll try. So if you distill most applications into their basic functional components. Yeah you're going to find that there are well, about eight that commonly appear across the gamut of embedded applications. Okay. Those will be output and signal generation, and these are microchip marketing terms, but they're appropriately named, we think. Okay. There's input and sensor interface, interfacing with the real world. Yeah. Motor control, that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Power conversion and charging, and that's something that's really, really taken off in the past few years for small embedded devices. System and safety management, because, well, you don't want uh, your dishwasher to spew hot water at you or anything no. like that. <laughs> System communications, always been a big perennial favorite of mine. <laughs> Timing and counting, very simple, but very, very important. Yeah. Human interface, that's also something. When we're talking touch buttons or touch screens, that's right. something that we all want to implement on our systems. So you take a look at those eight basic functions. And traditionally, most of those required some combination of software, CPU MIPS, mm -hmm. and external componentry. Sure. Our approach is to support as many of those functions in hardware as possible. Okay. With the ability to link any peripheral to another without the CPU being involved. Nice, okay. So if you were to dive deeper into the supported functions on the right of the graphic, you'll find a wide array of digital and analog peripherals that I'm not gonna go into detail here today, but they can be configured to perform those functions, those eight basic ones and custom ones as well. Cool, okay. So this allows us to basically keep that CPU in sleep, and by doing that, we lower our overall power consumption, and we're able to provide you with an inexpensive 8-bit MCU to perform really complex system tasks. That's cool. So this sounds like a great idea, and I get what you're talking about, but let's walk through an, a specific example. All right. I can do that. I okay. can do that. So let's say you have become Amelia the Power Tools goddess. Okay. Excellent. And you're going to update your new drill. Okay, Amelia's a super awesome Drillomatic 5000. Yeah, let's call it the Drillomatic 5000. All right, excellent. Just, okay. Just to kind of uh, add a little levity here. Excellent. All right, so we're going to take that Drillomatic 5000 and basically we're going to increase the reliability of your tool. Excellent. The reasons you want to do that are obvious. You're going to have fewer warranty repair costs and you're going to have longer lasting tools, which means your, your customers are going to be happier. Sure. Now, the way you do that, to basically take that cheapy brushed DC motor out of your Drillomatic 5000 and replace it with a lower maintenance motor. Okay. Now, the most obvious choice for that is a brushless DC motor. Sure. Because they are more efficient. Mm -hmm. They last longer because they don't have brushes. You don't have to replace them. Right. There's a lack of electrical and friction losses because there's nothing basically breaking the motor, but yeah. as the brushes often do. You get smoother torque delivery, and you get the ability to drill holes in the side of your house at much <laughs> higher speeds. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so Wayne, am I right here that I'm going to be replacing my brushes with microcontrollers? Are, are we going to get apps on my Drillomatic 5000? 
Well, uh, <laughs> you could if you wanted to, but that actually would require a 32-bit MCU. May I suggest a PIC-32 micro? <laughs> okay, excellent. <laughs> but you know what we're going to do for the purposes of our little brainstorm here is basically just add that brushless DC motor. Okay. We're going to replace your brushes with a brushless motor. Now, typically, that would require a more powerful CPU than would drive your standard brushed motor. Right. But I'm going to show you how to do it with a fairly inexpensive 8-bit PIC microcontroller. Excellent. Now, the way you do it is essentially you'd have some component of waveform control yeah. that basically does your driving of the motor. Mm -hmm. You'd have some form of timing accounting function, sure. which is basically going to tell that waveform control when to turn on and off. And then you'd have something that would basically sense where that motor's position is so that you can make updates and essentially drive the motor forward. Okay. Traditionally now, you'd have to actually wire each individual piece of that functionality outside the microcontroller, or you'd have to use the CPU fully awake and sucking power to monitor and kind of quarterback the activities between all those functions. Right. What we've done is actually implemented a bit of glue into our 8-bit PIC microcontrollers called the configurable logic cell. And it binds your timing and counting function, your waveform control, and your analog bits together so that you have interconnectivity that didn't exist before. You can do this all on chip, and cool. you haven't woken the CPU. Excellent. So this means I'm going to have a lot less stuff and traces on my board, right? Absolutely. So that interconnectivity adds greater resolution for motor drives, and of course it gives you smoother speed transitions and things like that. Yeah. All right, Wayne, this is a closed loop thing, right? I got to have Hall effect sensors, but that's external components, right? This is true. Traditionally, you would use some Hall effect sensors to basically sense the position of the motor, feed that back into the microcontroller so that the microcontroller can react appropriately. Yeah. However, you can do what's called a centralist drive if you've got a smart enough MCU. Oh, okay. And we do. So what you can do is use a concept called back EMF to determine where that motor is. Okay. That requires very, very little external componentry, very inexpensive external componentry. Excellent. Wire that into the onboard intelligent analog modules, essentially your onboard A to D, that A to D can route itself through the logic and math function to help your waveform control determine where that motor is. Ah, okay. And that basically enables you to do it for very, very little additional resource. Excellent. So now I have my sweet new Drillomatic 5000, but knowing how much I need to use this bad boy, shouldn't I be worried about burning this puppy out? Well, you absolutely have to worry about it. All motors have voltage and current ratings. Right. Now, manufacturers kind of play a little bit with the voltage rating to get a little bit more torque out of the motor. So, you know, it's kind of safe to exceed the rated voltage every now and again. <laughs> but you don't want to exceed the rated current or you will have a smoked motor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what you got to do is basically add some sort of current feedback circuit into your system. Okay, so this is how I don't catch my drill on fire? Pretty much. We, okay. don't, we don't like burning <laughs> drills. No, we don't. We don't want to be responsible for burning <laughs> drills at Microchip Technology. My lawyers made me say that. <laughs> Back to the discussion, of course. <laughs> Current is actually fed into the intelligent analog componentry with very little external circuitry as well. Okay. Because we have products that have onboard op amps that ah. basically allow you to condition that signal. Those onboard op amps can be wired into the waveform control circuitry that will allow it to adjust and basically shut off the drive Cool. as current gets to its limit or exceeds its limit. Neat, okay. So once again, the CPU is still in sleep. We've gone through this entire example and the CPU is just getting some Zs. All right, Wayne, I was a bit skeptical we were gonna get by with an 8-bit here, but it seems that you're right. That CPU just seems to be sitting there, not doing anything, yeah, catching some Zs. Yeah, that's right, the core independent peripherals Kind of let the onboard hardware do the work while the CPU goes to sleep. Excellent. And we've got those high-resolution PWM capabilities across our product lineup that support really precise motor control functionality or even something like a low-cost switching power supply mm. for like a lighting application. Cool. Okay, yeah. This is going to help you significantly reduce software overhead. In fact, we've got some cool power supply and motor control systems running in our lab that we've architected with as few as 10 lines of code. What? 
That's, really? Yeah, absolutely. The core independent peripherals are super low latency. They're easy to set up, and they work autonomously. Wow. Okay. So you can do something really cool with all that CPU MIPS that you've got free, like, uh, I don't know, add wireless authentication to your Drillomatic 5000. Fantastic. Or you can add cloud connectivity. Hmm, interesting. That's right. All right, Wayne, I'm still a little worried here, though. Autonomous function enablement that you've got going on here, this must be a bear to set up. It's actually really, really easy. Really? In fact, I like to say it's so easy a marketing guy could do it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> No offense to, you know, guys like myself. <laughs> but we offer a tool called the MP Lab Code Configurator. Okay. Now, it is a plug-in, meaning it's basically a part of the free MP Lab IDE that we offer for all of our, at this point, over a thousand MCUs. And the Code Configurator is what I'd like to call engineering nirvana. Okay. You can get a function up and running in a few simple steps. It involves you picking the MCU you're going to work with. Okay. Then you'd select the functions that you need to implement, say motor control or whatever. Mm -hmm. And all you need to do is tell Code Configurator, you're going to set up the peripherals in a certain way. It will organize those peripherals. It will check for resource conflicts. And then hit the generate code button and it gives you your seven or 10 lines of glorious code. You're up and running, program it, you got your motor running. Okay, it seems like I have to do just about uh, nothing to get this up and running. Uh, don't tell my boss, Wayne. I absolutely Fine. won't. Okay. You, <laughs> you do have to show up for work though. That's kind of a requirement. Oh, yeah. okay. But uh, you know, other than that, you pop that code configurator open and it's super, super easy. It's flexible. You can actually use it to just configure your pick to turn on an LED or something like that. Or you can use it for some complex stuff like your power supply or the Drillomatic 5000. Excellent. It's super, super intelligent and because it's going to tell you when you've got your resource conflicts. And it's easy to use. Everything shows up in a nice little GUI. Mm -hmm. And did I mention it's free? That's excellent. All right, Wayne, I think I need a little recap here, if you don't mind. All right, so what we've done with 8-Bit Pick Micros, taking our holistic approach to system development, is change the paradigm. We've architected the product line to enable basic functions, and what you do with those is up to your imagination. Now, those functions can be implemented without the CPU even being awake. Excellent. The core independent peripherals work together with our intelligent analog hardware that's also on chip using the glue that binds our configurable logic cell mm -hmm. to enable these functions, and that gives you the ability to actually what we call stack functions. You can mm. add function one plus function two to add as many functions as you need cool. to get your application taken care of. And it's incredibly easy to get started. Code Configurator is just an awesome tool. We're very excited about it. And it's going to help you save money. You're going to save time, of course. And you're going to reduce your risk. Excellent. That sounds perfect for my next design. Awesome. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Wayne. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Amelia, it was an awesome discussion. Thank you. Before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you can download a free data sheet with more information about Microchip's 8-bit PIC microcontroller peripheral integration. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the EE Journal YouTube channel or the on-demand section of eejournal.com.